2 Peter, please, open your Bibles there. We're in chapter 1. Today's a continuation of our message from uh, last week, and uh, actually we'll, it'll end up being a three-parter um, because uh, Peter goes through a, a list of things here that uh, we don't want to just blow through, we want to we dig into. Picking it up here in the, in the middle of, uh, of a list that Peter gives, let me, let me sort of introdu- introduce where we're at this way. Have any of you ever been to a high school reunion? Any, anybody here go to one, a few hands? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Brenda and I went to her 10th uh, high school reunion, and that was enough for us. Uh, <laughs> they did, they just, we both just had our 30th high school reunion. We, we didn't go. But there's always that one guy at the high school reunion, right? The, the Jeff Spicoli type. Uh, you know, the, some of you are like, who's that, you know? And, before your time. Okay, Jack Black, I think Jack Black, Orange County. Okay, does that help you out? Just the, the, the dude that's, that's perpetually high, you know, just still getting high, you know, still sponging off his parents, uh, never really got his life on track. You know, there's always that guy. Now, thankfully, most of us left those days in our past. And if you haven't, if you are Jeff Spicoli, then I invite you to grow up, okay? Uh, most of us grew up. We got a job. We moved out. We started a family. Hashtag adulting, right? Okay? Uh, and so this is what, what we've done. Now, that's the idea of Second Peter in these opening verses. All right? Peter here, he, he's saying that Christians have to grow up and that we have to have fruitful lives. And so what he's doing here is he's telling us that there are ways that we can grow, things that we can add to our faith to grow up. And so we saw last week that fruitful growth requires, first of all, purposeful participation. That just as we add things to our life physically to grow up, we get a job, we move out, and so on, we mature. In that same way, there's things that we have to add to our life to grow spiritually. And the second point last week's message is that fruitful growth follows a practical path. And so this is that three-part series, as it were, the mini-series within a series that we're going through, uh, continuing in this week, this practical path that Peter lays out for us. And so we pick it up there in verse 5, and and he says, but also for this very reason. For what reason? Well, because he's given us his divine power that, 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 that gives us everything that we need for life and for godliness. And he's given us exceedingly great and precious promises that through them we can be partakers of the divine nature. We have a lot of things going on as children of God, and so... But also for that very reason, because we have so much potential, hey, we need to give all diligence, add to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For, he says in verse 8, if these things are yours... And abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To state that in the positive, if, this, if these things are ours, we will be abundantly fruitful. We'll grow up, okay? And so this is the idea. Peter laying out this practical path saying, look, there's, there's stuff that you have to add to your faith, all right? So, so hey, we have been given life. We have been born again. The, God, the, the, the Lord has given to us His Holy Spirit, and all of those things are works that God has done on our behalf. Just as you as a parent, you give your child an abundant inheritance. You've given them life. You put food in their mouth. You put a roof over their head. You give them a good education. And, and here, they're the beneficiaries of the fact that you walk to school uphill both ways for your entire life. And they did nothing to earn it, right? Those, those ungrateful freeloaders that, that are there just sponging off you, right? So what's the deal? What do you expect of your kids? What do you hope for your kids? Hey, grow up. Mature. You have to engage. There's stuff that you have to do as well. I, you, you just can't always just live on the gravy train. 
And so spiritually speaking, listen, we got to grow up and this fruitful growth follows a practical path that we put one foot in front of the other as we're growing, as we're maturing. The first thing that Peter talks about is virtue. We looked at it last week. It means moral excellence. The idea is that as Christians, we are to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. That, that we are to glorify God, we're to reflect Him in all of our actions, and thankfully we do this in cooperation with God. The Bible says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, but then the encouragement, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. It's both and. We work, God works. It's the picture of bench pressing on, you know, the, 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 the bench press there, and, and you've got a spotter, and what's happening, he's shouting encouragement, but he's got his hands on the bar, he's helping you as you lift as well. It's both and. And so we are to add to our faith virtue. Peter continues, he says, we are to add to our faith knowledge. Again, looked at it last week. This word, the particular word that he uses here. Well, Warren Wiersbe describes it as knowledge that is growing, and the idea is that if we're called to live according to a particular standard, according to this virtuous way, morally excellent way, that, hey, we should understand what that standard is. And so we're to add to our faith the knowledge of God, because if you know Him more, you're going to sin less. Then Peter goes on, he talks about self-control. And again, I'm blowing through these because we looked at all of these last week. If you missed the message, you can get it online. Um, but just bringing you up to speed to where we're going to pick it up today. So uh, he says, add to knowledge self-control. And again, the idea here is that as you know and grow in Jesus, the better able you are going to be to control yourself. Uh, the more you know, the more you'll grow, and the more it will show. That's the idea. So then Peter says, okay, so, so you add to your faith virtue, you add to virtue knowledge, you add to knowledge self-control, and then he says, and this is where we left off last week, he says you add to self-control perseverance. And as we saw last week, perseverance is patience, but it's more than patience. It's remaining strong in the face of unwelcomed toil and trial and hardship and adversity. And it's remaining strong in the face of these things with a forward look of faith. It's not as though you just, you know, reluctantly or just surrender and resign yourself to find this is miserable, horrible trial that I'm going through. No, it's you endure the trial, looking through the trial to the Lord, trusting in a forward progress that, hey, I belong to God. He's promised that all things work together for good to those that love Him and are the called according to His purpose. And so this is the idea of perseverance that Peter is talking about here. It's doing what Jesus modeled, what Hebrews 12, 2 tells us about the Lord, that we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That word endured is this word perseverance, the same Greek word. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so this is, this is where uh, we've been. These are the things that Peter says we are to add. And so we continue now in verse 6, and Peter says that we are to add to our faith godliness. Godliness. If you're into taking notes in your Bible, you could circle that word godliness. Nearby, you could write devout reverence for God. That's literally what that word godliness means. It means a devout reverence for God. In the Greek, the Greek word is eusebia. And the Greeks used this word, eusebia. They used it in reference to their ritualistic actions related to the worship of their gods. Okay, their ritualistic actions in related to the worship of their gods. In other words, it was a word used to describe not just their beliefs, but more accurately, the actions that they took because of their beliefs. And Peter now uses this same Greek word here to focus on the one true living God. And, and the idea is that your behavior, listen, should be godlike. That's what he's saying. That you should add to your faith a godlike conduct. 
that you should carry yourself in the way of God. It should be an exercise of true religion. It should be an exercise of true worship, the way that you live your life, in the sense that, hey, if you add this behavior to your life, that you're ultimately and properly going to honor God, that you're going to properly adore God by this action that you're undertaking. And right now, I would just have you maybe in your mind's eye, review the past actions of this last week, maybe even last night. And I would ask you, how does your life measure up? Are you, in fact, adding godliness to your life, or are there other things that you're adding to your life? Now, let me illustrate this idea, this, this word godliness, and really what it means practically applied. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate it with an ungodly example. Uh, how the pagans worshipped their god Molech. Now, in in the book of Leviticus, um, you get to about chapter eighteen, and basically there, what's happening is God is giving His people instructions on how they're to behave, on how they're to live, on how they're to worship Him. And so, as He begins to outline, well, I'll put uh, Leviticus, Leviticus eighteen three up on the screen. He says this to to the Israelites. He says, according to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt. You shall not do, and according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. In their ordinances. So he's basically saying, look, I'm telling you how to live, and what I don't want you to do is live the way these guys that you're living near have been living. Something's never changed. God would say to us today, <laughs> the stuff, turn on MTV, yeah, don't do that, okay? This is, this is what he's talking about. Now, he, he then, the Lord, uh, through the, the book of Leviticus, begins to outline for the people specific things that he wants them to do, specific behaviors. And we get to 1821, Leviticus 18.21, and he says, And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Now, this is one of many things that he's telling them, don't do this and do this and so on. And so then here he's talking about a very specific practice. He's saying, basically, look, you're going into the land of Canaan, and there they worship this God, Molech. Well, who's Molech? What's he all about? Moloch is the pagan god of sex, okay? And the way that they, and this is graphic and I apologize, but, but, it's, but it's what happened and what they did and what God is cautioning against. And it's profoundly relevant to the day in which we live. The way that they would worship Moloch is that they would have a bronze statue of Moloch. They would heat this bronze statue up red hot and then they would take their infant children and lay them on the statue. And then the drums would beat to drown out the, the horrible sounds that that infant would make until the infant was dead. And why did they worship in this way? Why was this their practice? Because they worshiped the God of sex. And so, well, you can see, you can see that Moloch is still worshiped today, isn't he? He's still worshipped today. Now that may have been the way that the pagans worshipped their God. And we can say by that bad example, by that negative example of their, of their actions, hey, that's not true religion for God's children, is it? That is not truly a way, that is not truly an action, that is not a way that in, 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 in verb form that we pay devout reverence for God. And yet, according to Pastor Scott Sharpen, who we had out here recently, who heads up the ministry Go Mobile for Life, a mobile imaging uh, pregnancy center which seeks to, to get women who are considering an abortion to consider rather keeping their babies because studies have shown that 9 out of 10 women who are shown an image of their, of their unborn children in their womb make the decision to keep their children to keep that baby and not kill that baby, to not offer, as it were, that baby up to the pagan god of Molech. 
And according to Pastor Scott Sharpen, a, a good number of the women that come to him that are actually considering abortion are in fact Christian women. See, what happens is, and this is just one area to illustrate this principle, and this principle is this, that we so often want to live compartmentalized lives. That we want to be able to say, well, I'm going to worship the Lord over here, but over here, in this area of my life, I'm going to wink at the Scriptures, and we're just going to sweep that one under the rug. And I'm just going to say, well, God's merciful, God's forgiving, and so, you know, I can do this. And we have, by and large, in our day and age, a Christian church that does not want to add godliness to its life. That does it when it's convenient, but has wholesale areas of our lives where we say, oh, you know what, I can, I can live like Hades and hope to go to heaven. Turn to um, James chapter 1. It's, it's one book to the left. James chapter 1. Notice there, beginning in verse 21, he says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. James chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But, what do we pray every week? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then he says, what happens if you are hearers only? You deceive yourself. You're deceiving yourself. So often we think that, you know, if I read the Word and if I agree with it, that that's enough. That is not enough. The Bible tells us that even the demons believe in Jesus Christ and they tremble. But the inference is they're not saved. Why? Because belief is not enough. Your belief must be accompanied by action. Your belief has to be accompanied by action. There has to be a follow-through. Now, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by our works. But we are not saved to live any old way that we want. We are saved to be children of God and submissive to God. We are saved to enter into a relationship with God, and when we are saved, when we understand, when we comprehend what we have been forgiven of, and how we have received such grace and mercy from God, well, it's His kindness that leads us to repentance, and there should be a demonstrable part of you that now is no longer content to live any old way you want. And if you pay attention, if you truly belong to God, well, then you're going to know you're His because if you want to go in an area and compartmentalize your life, the Holy Spirit is going to be right there saying, hey, don't do that. Hey, that's not something you should be engaged in. That, that is not a way that you are going to live out in action your faith in me. That is not devout reverence for me what you're doing right now. <clears throat> but what happens is we think, oh, I believe it, and so I'm good. And according to James, we, we deceive ourselves. No, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Real religion is not shown by hearing the word, but by doing the word. Paul said this to Timothy, he said, exercise yourselves towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So Peter says, add to your faith godliness. Now back in 2 Peter, what's the next thing he says? Well, add to your godliness brotherly kindness. Add to godliness brotherly 
kindness. Now, this is always the way things work in the kingdom of God, just so you know. It's always this way in the kingdom of God that what happens is, is that we're oriented vertically and then we're oriented horizontally, okay? Vertical worship, then horizontal worship. Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment in the law? And he said, well, the, the most important commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. And then he gave him a freebie. He says, the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus went on to say that on these two commandments hinge all the law and the prophets. In other words, your entire Bible, 66 books of the Bible that you hold in your lap, are all summed up in two commandments, love God and love others. And so Peter says here, add to your faith brotherly kindness, okay? And so this, this phrase, this word, brotherly kindness, if you wanted to circle it, um, well, let me just give you the Greek word. It's Philadelphia. That's a familiar Greek word, probably the most recognizable Greek word for, for, for many. What, what's the motto of Philadelphia, anybody? City of brotherly love. Guess what Philadelphia means? Brotherly love. It's kind of redundant when you think about it. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. It's basically brotherly love, city of brotherly love. It's like saying, I want a quesadilla with tortilla and cheese, please. You know? But that's the idea. This is what this phrase, brotherly kindness, it means Philadelphia. It means brotherly love. Now, we are commanded throughout the New Testament that we are to do this, that we are to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus, John 15, 12, he said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, that phrase, one another, it literally means reciprocally and mutually. In other words, it's, it's both proactive and it's reactive. That you're to initiate this love and you're to reciprocate this love. And that your brother, your sister in Christ, they're to initiate the love and they're to reciprocate the love that you give. This is the way it's supposed to work. And Jesus said that it's by this all will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Paul told the Thessalonians this, he said, but concerning brotherly love, Philadelphia, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Paul goes, I don't even need to teach this. God has taught this and been teaching this, and Jesus said it himself, that you're to love one another. The Apostle John wrote, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, why does the Bible emphasize this point so often and so adamantly? Because it's easy to say, and it's hard to do. Isn't it? You've heard the saying? Church would be a great place. If it wasn't for all the people. In fact, right now, you know, we can think of, I'm sure, in our mind's eye, brothers and sisters in Christ that just irritate us. Maybe we're divided from. I can think of a few faces right now, just, you know, preaching the message. It's true. I mean, let's just be honest, right? And over and over again, God's saying, no, you know, love one another. You know, you have to show this brotherly kindness, this brotherly love, this family love. You ever had, you ever had a situation like that? You just, you, you know, you, 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 can, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family, right? <laughs> and, and, and there are times when things in family get a little tense, Get a little hot. Get a little worked. Let's just put it that way. And maybe one of your friends is even aware of what you're going through. And they'll ask you at some point. They'll say, hey, you know, hey, how are things going, you know, with your brother, your sister, whatever it is. And, and have you ever caught yourself saying, you know what, it's tough, but we're family. And that says it all. We're family. We're, we're going to work through this. And that's the attitude here, that we in the body of Christ, we're, we're, our attitude is supposed to be, look, we're, this is tough, but we're family. So 
we got to work through it. You know, it, it's funny. Sometimes people will complain, and, and they'll say, man, you know, the church today, it's so messed up. I, I wish we could have the church of the first century. Okay, let's take a look at the church of the first century, okay? Go back to James. Go to James chapter 2. You already know where it is now. So had you turned there before, a couple of books to your left. James chapter 2. And here James is writing to the church of the first century here. And so James chapter 2, we'll pick it up in verse 1. He says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. <clears throat> For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. You can, you can sit on the floor, I guess. That, that, that's good enough for you. Verse 4, he says, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith <coughs> and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor man? Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now James' point is simply this. He's saying, look, the church is guilty of not showing brotherly kindness to everyone equally. And he says, look, you're showing favoritism to the rich over the poor. And he says, in effect, look, that's ironic because the rich are the ones that typically do that to you. It's so ironic that you're acting this way. And then he adds this. He says, they blaspheme that noble name by which you are called. Now, when, Peter does, or when James does that, it's really a backhanded implication on their faith. And basically what he's saying is, you Christians are guilty of doing the exact same thing. You are blaspheming the name by which you were called by treating one brother well and treating another brother badly. That's what he's talking about. Now, I'll give you an example of, of this point. On June 14th, 1985... Brenda Elder became Brenda Leavenworth. We were married. She took my name. Now, what then if, now she's got this new identity, right? This new name. What then if she went about, and rather than, you know, it's 31 years she's had my name. She took my name at 20, so you do the math. She's been Leavenworth longer than she ever was an elder, right? It's her new identity, what if she took that identity and then she promptly went out and partied every night? What if she took that identity and she said, hey, you know what, I'm going to go date other guys? What if it wasn't even every night? What if it was, you know, once every six years? Hey, I'm, I'm going to go shack up with some guy. Now, is she then blaspheming the name by which she's been called? The answer is Yes. And you're like, oh, what about the dude? Okay, you know what? I've got a new name too. It's husband, right? If I go out and do those things, am I blaspheming the name by which I'm called? Answer is yes. Duh, right? That's James' point. James' point. He says, we've taken Christ's name and we need to act like it. So, so James says, look, if you show partiality, you commit sin, and you're convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. In other words, his point is, you can't compartmentalize your faith. Can't do it. He, he, he's saying, you can't have a trail of broken relationships in your life. This is, this is not what God has called us to. We have to love our brothers in Christ. We have to love our sisters in Christ. Now, easy takeaway Something to take a walk with. Question, do you? 
Are you divided from a brother in Christ today? Are you divided from a sister in Christ today? And if the answer is yes, listen, you need to go to him. And you go, well, you know what, Pastor Ted? I, uh-uh. No, that's not your place to say. You have no idea what they did. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, get what God is saying here. What he's saying here is that if you're divided from a brother or a sister in Christ, it's so important to him that he says, don't, don't come to worship me until you get that right. Get that straightened out. Now, if you've, if you've got kids, you get the heart of this. You understand. Yes, you want your kids' love. Yes, you want your kids coming to you. But you don't want your kids divided from one another. I mean, how many times did we tell our kids, look, you're Leavenworths. Work it out. You guys are best friends. Knock it off. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. You're not going to treat your sister like that, you know. We, did, we, didn't, we would not tolerate it. Why? Because I want my kids to get along. It is, it is such a great joy for me as now I watch all of my children, adults, parents in their own right, children of their own, and yet my children talk every day. We have, we have a family group text and, and this, you know, back and forth and, and it's, it's one of my greatest joys to see my kids laugh with each other, joking with each other in fellowship with each other. And so Jesus says, man, if you're bringing your gift to the altar and there you remember your brother's got something against you, man, you got to go and make it right. Now, some of you at this point, you're thinking, you know what? There it is right there. There's my, lip, my loophole. Because it says if, if your brother has something against you, listen, he ain't got nothing on me. All right? He's guilty of sin. It's all on him. All right. Well, Matthew 18. 15, Jesus said, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. See, God's got it covered both ways. If you've sinned against your brother, you've got to go to him. If he sinned against you, you have to go to him. Now reverse that. If you've sinned against him, he has to go to you. If he sinned against you, he has to go to you. God's got a bad, this is a, a double redundant system that makes NASA look weak, man. God's like, look, I'm so interested in the relationship, I'm going to put the responsibility on both y'all so that this brotherly kindness is maintained. Because that's a priority to me, God would say. God wants us to love one another. He wants us to put on brotherly kindness. Now, before we go back to to 2 Peter, I want you to notice what James says there in verse 8. He says, if you really fulfill, fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Now, James is quoting here from Leviticus 19, verse 18. And, and notice that he refers to it as the royal law. Why does he call it the royal law? Well, he calls it the royal law because this is the law that Jesus cited when he answered the question, what's the most important commandment in the law? And he said... You, show, you, you to, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is what he's quoting from there. And so this is why he calls it the royal law. Because Jesus said that the two great commandments are to love God and love others. Now this comes from the Ten Commandments. When the guy asked the question and said, hey, what's the most important commandment in the law? He's, he's, he's talking primarily about the Ten Commandments. What's the most important commandment in the law? Jesus' answer basically says, look, the whole Ten Commandments is summed up, love God, love others. First four commandments. First commandment, one God. Worship God and Him only. Second commandment, not supposed to have any idols. Third commandment, not to take the Lord's name in vain. Fourth commandment, you remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. All of these commandments, they pertain to your relationship with God. To that vertical relationship. And then the last six, they pertain to your relationship with mankind. Fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. 
Sixth commandment, you're not supposed to murder. Seventh commandment, you're not supposed to commit adultery. Eighth commandment, you're not supposed to steal. Ninth commandment, you're not supposed to lie. Tenth commandment, you're not supposed to covet. All of those relating to your relationship with mankind. Now, easy way, by the way, to remember that, just just so you know. Easy, cheesy Ten Commandments. One, there's one God. Two, cut out idols. Three, watch your words. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Four, it's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. How many tires are on your car? Four, what do you drive to church? Your car? <laughs> Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Okay? <laughs> Sixth commandment, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't murder. Okay? <laughs> Seventh commandment, these two people, they stay away from these people, don't commit adultery. <laughs> Eighth commandment, you go to some countries, if you steal something that cut off a finger, this guy's a two-time loser, okay? Eighth commandment, don't steal. Ninth commandment, these guys are standing, this guy is lying, okay? Don't lie. Tenth commandment, I want it, I want it, I want it, don't covet, all right? Easy way to remember the Ten Commandments, all right? Thank you, children's ministry, okay? Wisdom from the mouth of babes. James says, look, if you really fulfill fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you want to keep the Ten Commandments, look. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's, it's critically important. You want to keep those six commandments, you focus on adding this love of the brethren. You, 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 you focus on, on, on adding this thing to your life to where, man, brotherly kindness is going to be added to my life. I just ask you the question, is it added to yours? Now, back in 2 Peter, we're going to see that the next thing he says to add is that we're to add love. Add to brotherly kindness, love. Now, we've been talking about loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that are, that are saved. Those that you're going to spend eternity with. And that is the whole idea of brotherly kindness. It's, a, it's an orientation towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. But listen, when God commands us to love, it's not just our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's everyone. Jesus said this in Luke's Gospel. He says, love your enemies... Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. And several verses later, he says, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Likewise, But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And the word that he's using here is the same word he uses in 2 Peter, and it's the Greek word agape. Now, <clears throat> this was tough decision time for me in my study because there is a lot to unpack in this one little word. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop here. I'm going to save this for next week. We're going we're to conclude the message right here. But in closing, I want to give you several application points. Just some questions that have you write down. I'm going to put them on the screen for you. We'll leave them up. You can take a picture with your phone, um, but they're going to stay up for a while. Um, Here's some takeaway questions today. Number one, have you been diligent to add godliness to your life daily? I'd like you to take a walk with this question this week. Honest, don't just answer it. Take a real prayerful walk. Let the Lord, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, help you. Have you been diligent to add godliness to your, to your daily life? Two sub-questions to that. If not, where can I start? And the the next question, if yes, then what's next? Second question, is there anything ungodly in your life that needs to go away? Anything ungodly in your life that needs to go away? And a sub-question to that is, who can you invite to hold you accountable to that? Third question, are you characterized by extending brotherly kindness to others? Is that, is that your character, your nature, to be kind, to be forgiving, to be loving? 
And the two sub-questions, is there a brother or sister in Christ that you need to forgive? And is there someone whom God is telling you to reach out to that you need to extend brotherly kindness to? One of the things I love about our church, and I wish it were this way in every church, and, and, and sadly it's not, but one of the things I love about our church is how relationally connected y'all are. And we, we've put a lot of intentionality into ke- helping you to connect relationally with one another. But I love how you're connected with one another because the Bible says we're to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ and that we're to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the countenance of his friend. That there, There's this relational component. It's amazing just as a study to consider all the one another's of the Bible. God wants us connected relationally. And so, so it, it, it's so important that we put on godliness, that we act like God, and that we put on this kindness towards one another.